If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be continuing with the first Christian message given by the Apostle Peter. We're going to start in verse 22. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We have one in the back as a gift for you. And also we'll have it on the screen. Out of reverence for God's word, let's stand as I read from Acts chapter 2, 22 through 41. This is God's word. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongues rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set on his descendants on uh, on his descendants on this throne, on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day, about 3,000 souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day, another day to worship you, another day to uh, grow in an understanding of you. We pray that uh, we would change, that we would go out into this week, new people, renewed in your grace. And we know that we need you. We ask for you now. Amen. You may be seated. This is the second week going through this message that Peter delivers. It's the first Christian message. God sends the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit, and immediately they go out and start to preach. And this is the first recorded Christian preaching done by the Apostle Peter. And one of the things that people will point out that study biblical interpretation as they teach people how to interpret the Bible is if you want to grow an understanding of a passage it's good to put yourself in different vantage points with the different characters that are involved in the story. So, for example, if you're reading the Christmas story about the Virgin Mary, you can grow an understanding of that story if you just place yourself for a second in the shoes of Mary. And you think of, what was she thinking? Oh, she must have been scared, must have been alarmed, must have been like, how are people going to react? All of these things. Or you put yourself in the shoes of the angel. You know, the angel has probably witnessed what God has done through for hundreds and hundreds of years, and now it's getting to this point, the excitement of delivering that message to Mary. Or if you put yourself in the shoes of Joseph 
her fiance. And at first disbelieving, there's just no way that what you're saying is true. And then God giving you a dream and you knowing, knowing it's true. And then the weight of what, how am I going to raise the Messiah? How is that, how is that going to work? So if, if you just put yourself in the different character's shoes, you'll grow in an understanding of what's going on. And that's what we're going to, going to do this morning. We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the two main characters in this story. The first being the Apostle Peter, the one delivering the message. And the second being the crowd, those who are receiving the message. They're hearing and they're contemplating what he's saying. And the reason why I want to focus on those two vantage points is every Sunday, we basically want to hit those two vantage points. I know there are many of us that have been Christians, and you've been Christians for a while, and one of the main driving things that the Spirit produces in you is you want other people to hear the message. You want other people to see what you have seen. You want other pe people to experience the God that you've experienced. So you want to know how to do that. How do you present the Christian message in a compelling way, in an accurate way? Well, we're going to look at that. How do you actually do that? But also, every week, every Sunday, we also want to address people that are contemplating the Christian message. People that are curious or skeptical. What does Jesus actually teach? I don't know if I believe it. I don't know who he is. You know, oftentimes, and it breaks my heart when, when this happens, I'll be talking to someone that says, you know, I, have, I would just reject it. I, I don't believe it. And then they relay what they've rejected. And the thing that breaks my heart is not necessarily the rejection. It's this that oftentimes what people are rejecting isn't actually the Christian message. It's maybe a, a, something that's been relayed to them that's not accurate, or a conclusions that they've come to that are not from the mouth of Jesus. And it's at the very least, if someone comes to the point where like, yes, I reject it, I want people to know, and we want people to know what they are rejecting. So if you're here and you're curious or you're skeptical and you're kind of looking into things, well, this is for you too. You're in the, the place of the audience, hearing the message and contemplating, is it true? Is what Peter is saying true? So with those two vantage points in mind, let's look at these three things that we'll see in this passage. The Christian message is Christ-centered. If you want to present it, if you want to understand it, you have to understand it's Christ-centered, it's biblical, and it's life-transforming. Christ-centered, biblical, and life-transforming. First, Christ-centered. There's a joke, and it's called the purple ping-pong ball joke. Have you guys heard of this? I know some, some of you know, <laughs> know this. So some people in the back are giving the, the thumbs down. So this is what the, the joke is. And I'm, I'm ruining it for, future, for the future for some people. The purple ping pong joke is a story. And the story goes like this, that this uh, man, or he starts off as a boy. Whenever he does something good, his father gives him a purple ping pong ball. Okay. And that's really the, the whole, like, throughout the whole story of his life, from a child up until when he's adult, he's giving a purple ping pong ball. And at the end of the story, it gets to the father's deathbed, and the son just needs to know why. Why the purple ping pong ball? And he goes to his father, and he's asking, why the purple ping pong ball? And the father says, I give you a purple ping pong ball because... And then he dies. And that's the joke. The joke is you just ruined, you know, however long you told the story. There's no resolution. In fact, I think Colton Thrain told this story fairly recently for an hour. <laughs> and it ended, a good solid hour, and it ended with, and then the father dies. And it's funny because people, people that go through this are uh, mad to varying degrees that you just wasted 15 to 20 to an hour. Uh, 60 minutes of their time. And the reason why people are mad is because we want the point. Like, what's the point of the story? You, you're, you're listening the whole time, you're the whole time, and you want to know what's the purple ping pong ball about. And the point is that there isn't a point. And that's what's infuriating about the story. Peter, is a, he's not a, uh, a skilled uh, rhetoric speaker. He's, he's not like... He's not skilled in that way. He was, he was a fisherman. But he, he knows enough about presenting to a group of people that you should get to the point immediately. This is the main point. 
this is what you need to understand. So he answers their question. He's, they're asking, what's going on here? Are you guys drunk? That's what they're asking. And he quotes Joel to answer their question, and then he immediately gets to the point. This is what he says. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. He just gets right to Jesus. One commentator says, somewhat abruptly, he directs his attention back to Jesus. Another one said, Christian preaching begins with the name of Jesus. He just kind of just cuts to it. This is Jesus. This is the point of everything that I am going to tell you. Jesus is the point of the message. Like if you want to understand the Christian message, you have to start with Jesus, the God-man. You have to start with him. I, I, last night, we were at a dinner party for uh, a, a birthday party for this kid named Cole. He's a year year old, you know, so of course he's the only one who doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> it's, his, it's his birthday party, he's a year. And I met this man, he's, his name is Mark, and I'm guessing he's in his 60s, maybe 70s. And he tells me the story of how he became a Christian. He grew up around here, and he was 18. And this older woman in Bristol started to, to share the gospel with him, and he started to bring his other 18-year-old friends. And just at that, you just think, that's such a bizarre thing. You know, it's like all these 18-year-old boys are going to this elderly woman to, to learn things. You know, it's like it's such a bizarre type of way to start. And he said this line, which I, I don't think I'll forget. At least I won't forget today, because it's the next day. And he, <laughs> and he says this. It's like, she had so many wacky ideas, but she loved Jesus. Like, she knew the main point. She loved Jesus. And at 18 years old, he just saw the love of Jesus in this elderly woman's life, and that's when he became a Christian. That's what it, and I'm like, wow. And it, it was just, he even knew, of reflecting back, of like, yeah, she had a lot of kooky theology, she had a lot of kooky things going on, but man, she loved Jesus. She got the main point. And I was thinking, it'd be, it's so much better to get the main point you could have everything else right. Your theology could be pristine. Your life could be crystal clear. You could just have everything together, everything organized to a T, file folded in alphabetical order, whatever, whatever it is. That could be your life. But if you miss the main point, you miss it all. Peter gets to the main point. Jesus of Nazareth. This is the point. Look at him. And then he says, Verse 22, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. He says, we know who he is because he did signs and wonders. And the point of signs, the point of wonders, is, well, it's in the words. It's a sign directs you to something. If you're driving to the beach and it says two miles to Narragansett Beach, you know, you know okay, in two miles, I'm going to be there. The sign directs you to your destination. Well, the same thing goes with the signs and wonders, these miracles that Jesus did. It pointed to his identity. This is who Jesus is. It made them wonder in awe of who Jesus is and his true identity. He is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's God coming in the flesh. That's what the signs are for. Now, something I learned this last week that I didn't know previously until studying this is that uh, there are, we have a lot of early Jewish writings about Jesus. And when I say early Jewish writings, I don't mean like what we find in the New Testament. I mean about Jesus from a skeptical point of view. Like people that didn't believe he was the Messiah, but they're recording the teachings of Jesus and things about Jesus. The most famous, um, some of you have probably heard of this name, Josephus. He was an early Jewish historian um, employed by the Romans. And these writings about Jesus, what's fascinating about them is nobody discounts the miracles. Nobody says these miracles didn't happen. People say they happened, but they didn't happen. They all assume them to be true. They say this happened. They just give a different source. It's like it was by witchcraft or it was by magic or it was by whatever it is. They all like these miracles happened. He wasn't the Messiah. He certainly wasn't God, but these miracles happened. And Peter's saying the same thing. They happened, but he has a different source. It's because he's God. It's because he's the Messiah. It's because he's the Lord. That's their signs to his true identity. And then he continues. And the, the crazy thing is, is we think a, a miracle or a sign or something miraculous would be like the point. It's like, and then that happened. And that's the climax of the story. 
But that's not the way the Bible presents it. It's the drum roll to the main point. This is what Peter says, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So the main point is what Jesus does on the cross. He was delivered up, he was killed, he was crucified by lawless men. That's the main point. It's getting to the cross. There's a reason why if you, if you just drive around, even Providence, you just drive around Providence, you look at the top of the church, what will you see? You'll see a cross. Makes for a good necklace, too, and a good leg tattoo. <laughs> it's like if you, it's all those things. There's a reason why it's been a symbol of Christianity for years and years and years. Not the only one, but one of the main ones. Because if you want to see what Jesus truly accomplished, the biggest thing, you look to the cross. Now, this passage, it's actually, it gets really deep into a very complex question. Not just at the cross, but even just how God works in the world. Because this is what it says, the definite plan in foreknowledge of God. And then what's a part of his definite plan? Well, people killing the Messiah. People doing something extremely evil. And it gets to the point of, oh, how does that work? How does God make a plan and then have his, impl- his plan accomplished through evil means? Like people doing something that are something that is truly atrocious and something that is truly evil. This is one of the pr- passages that brings up the question of how is God in control, yet we're still free to make decisions. Or another way of putting that is if God's in control of everything, how does He hold us responsible? You know, if this is part of His plan. How does He how does He say by lawless men, by evil men? Like He's obviously holding them responsible, but it's a part of God's plan. Now, this question um, is sometimes answered by Christians where it's God's plan because he just knew it would happen beforehand. And it says it right here, it's foreknowledge. But we know that cannot explain the whole picture. And the reason is these two words used by Peter, definite and plan. Uh, Acts 11.29 uses the same word in reference to the disciples. So the disciples determined, same Greek word for definite translated here, everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So there's a, a, a plague coming, not, excuse me, not a plague, there's a famine coming, and they knew this was going to happen, so they stored up money, planning for the future. They, may, they determined that's, that's what they were going to do. Beforehand, they made a plan. They determined in their minds. And then it says the word plan. Acts 5.8 uses this word in reference to humans. It says, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or, the, uh, or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. Again, it's used in reference to the way men make plans. People make plans. We determine things. We determine, you know what? I'm out of milk. I'm going to go and get some milk after church or whatever. We make plans like that. We determine things like that. And it's not because we foreknow something. We know, I just foreknow I'm going to get milk. No, it's predetermined. We're like, I'm, I'm making it, and it's going to happen because I've made the decision to do it. And this get, just kind of pushes into, like, the mystery of, like, how, well, how does that work? How does, that, how does God predetermine to accomplish his purposes even in the midst of evil, even using evil? Now, there are three ways people can address this question. One, bad, and two, life-giving. The bad way is that people will say this. Well, if God's all-powerful, then I'm not held responsible. If God's, in, if God's in control, if he has a determined plan, then how can he judge me? And the Bible addresses this question head-on. It's like we know it's going to come up. Uh, Paul knows it's going to come up. He addresses in Romans 3, Romans 9. He knows it's going to come up. And he says, who are you, O man? Meaning, you don't know. You're, 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 ba- you're boxing out of your weight class here. Because you know that you are guilty. Like, whenever we throw that back at God of like, well, if you're in control, then how can I be guilty? The response is, well, don't you know? Like, have you ever experienced guilt? shame before? 
and everyone has. Everyone has a sense of guilt. I got coffee with, with um, a guy who's a, a barista in town uh, this Friday. And I asked him, have you ever done something you know it was bad at the moment, and you did it, and you felt guilt, and you felt shame? And he's like, yeah, everyone does. And it's, it's obvious. Everyone has experienced that. Everyone has a sense of guilt. And this guy's not a Christian, not even a little bit. And, and you just go around asking that question, no one would be like, ah, yeah, it's, I've heard other people experience it. No, everyone, everyone has experienced that. So we can't throw it back at God and say, well, I'm not guilty. We know we are. It is a mystery for sure, but we know that that can't be the answer. So what's the life-giving answers? The first one is this. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, so evil that God cannot use for good. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, so evil that God cannot use for good. Think of this. That by his planned, determined foreknowledge, he chose for people to murder his son. The most evil event in history. The worst thing that has ever happened, humanity killing God. That's pretty evil. He used it for good. And in fact, if you're there at that moment, and you're one, you know, one of the soldiers, one of the people weeping, or one of the Jewish leaders jeering at him and, and cursing him, you would be witnessing one of the most evil acts. But at the same time, at the same time, you'd be witnessing one of the most gracious and good and life-giving acts in history. Not just one of them, the, the best event in history. And now, how does that, how does that work? Well, we know how it worked with the cross. That they, thought they, were, they thought they were winning, but they were actually losing. And if it applies to the greatest event of all history and the most of evil event in all history, then we can look at our own lives and the evil that has happened in our lives or the evil that we have done, both evil that we have done and things that have been done to us, and see that there's nothing so evil that God cannot undo and that God cannot use. Absolutely everything. Now, this doesn't mean that you'll know what he's doing in the moment. It's not like immediately after it happens, you know the grand plan. No, that's not the case at all. Sometimes you won't know until after you die what he was accomplishing. But God has a way of using everything. He will use even the most evil acts. The second life-giving way of looking at this is considering the character of God. This shows his power. That he is so powerful and so smart. You know, we barely know checkers. He's playing 4D chess. You know, it's like he's so up there in his position, in his ability, in his knowledge. He's up here. We're down here. And how does he choose to use that power? How does he choose to use that knowledge? How does he choose to use that strength? He uses it to die. He's saying by his, his plan, his determined plan and foreknowledge and all of this, well, what is he de determined to do? To die for us? See, when we have position, when we have power, when we have resources, when we have time, <laughs> all these things that we have in a way more feeble way, that's not how we tend to use that. Like, that's not how we tend to use it. We use it in a different way. But thankfully, God is not like us. He uses his power to die. He, he uses his power to become a man. The person who spoke Jupiter into existence decided to become a babe and have his mother take care of him. Like that's how a sovereign God uses his sovereignty. And if those two things, there's no evil too evil that God cannot use, and the God who is that powerful and that intelligent that can use even the worst of things while not getting his own hands dirty, uses his power to die for you, if those two things, if you just walk away and those two things just go a little bit deeper in your soul, 
your life will be changed. You'll think of power differently. You'll think of uh, advantages that you have differently. You'll, you'll think of trials differently. You'll be able to walk into the future with a hope that cannot be touched because you know that anything that comes in front of you, God can use. Absolutely anything. You can look at the evils of the past. You can read any history book unflinching because you know that God has a way to use absolutely everything. He uses all the parts of the buffalo. Everything. For his glory and for his good. The theologian A. Fernando said Christ or Christianity is Christ. Christianity is Christ. This God who knows all, everything and uses everything, Jesus, it is all of Christianity. So think about the two vantage points. If you're here and you're curious, I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't even know what the Christian message is. I'm trying to figure out whether I believe it. I'm skeptical. I still have some doubts. Whatever it is, we'll start with Jesus. What do you think about Jesus? There are a lot of important questions to figure out, but don't figure out the most important one first. It's like, what do you think about Jesus? Don't go past him and try to figure out, well, how does this work? And it's like, you know, start there. Because if you, under, if you can understand Jesus, you just got to, you have the world. You have the world. It's like, it doesn't even matter. If you miss that point and you get everything else, it doesn't really matter. Start with him. And if you're here and you want to know, well, how do I present this message? I want to be like Peter and present, present this message to people. Well, present Jesus. It's like, it's so easy. There's so many things you can debate about, so many things you can discuss, so many things that uh, you can re- wrestle over and argue over. And many of them are very important things. But allow the greatest stumbling block that are, it's in front of somebody, allow the greatest debate that is in front of somebody to be the most important thing. What do you think about Jesus? And even if you get into political conversations, you know, you get to cultural conversations, that's fine. It's good to have, you know, it's good to have important conversations, but still bring it back to the main point. Well, that's great. We can talk about the way the government does this or that, or the way, you know, whatever it is. But let's bring it back to the main point. What do you think about Jesus? Put him in front of people. So the Christian message is Christ-centered. It's focused and centered on Jesus. The second thing is the Christian message is biblical. It's biblical. Peter starts off by quoting Joel, a prophet written 600 years before he gave this message. And then he continues to quote the Bible. C.S. Lewis talked about how we relate to God the way Shakespeare would relate to Hamlet. So Shakespeare wrote Hamlet into existence. Uh, He is the creator of Hamlet. Now, if Shakespeare wanted to communicate to Hamlet who he is, what would he have to do? Well, basically two things. You would have to write to him within the story, maybe write a message or write verbally communicate to him into the story or have someone bring another character bring him a message. He would have to write a message into the story or he would have to write himself into the story. Shakespeare could write himself into the story, walk up, you know, he's writing, and I, William Shakespeare, walk, walks up to Hamlet and says, hi, <laughs> I'm William, my friends call me Billy, or whatever, whatever it is. It's like, that's what he could do. And God, in, in communicating with us, in relating with us, does both. He writes himself into the story in Jesus, and then he writes his word into the story So for all time, we can understand who he is. That's what God does. So we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised at all that Peter, what he does is he he quotes the Bible, quotes Joel, and he quotes the Psalms. This is what he says in in Acts 2, quoting Psalm 16 uh, at verse 25. For David saying concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken, Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will dwell in hope, for you will not be abandoned to this. Uh, you have not abandoned my soul to Hades, or let your holy one see corruption, for you have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. 
This is the, the point of this psalm. Is he's saying, David wrote this, but we know it cannot refer to David. It says, you'll not abandon my soul to Hades, and you will not allow me to see corruption or, or decay. He's like, but we know where David's tomb is. He's, he's communicating this to a, a group of uh, Jewish hearers, and he's like, we know, we can go there, we can visit his tomb. This, written by David, cannot refer to David. It might be written by him, but it's not his voice. It's another voice. And it's the voice of Jesus. God did not allow him to see decay. God did not allow his soul to go to Hades, or the, the land of the dead, where the souls rest until the, to the end. It's like he, he didn't allow that. He resurrected in three days. If you go to his tomb, Peter is saying, if you go to his tomb, you're not going to find anything. You can't visit his tomb the way you can visit David's tomb. That's what he's saying. Now, this was a common interpretation at the time of the Psalms. It's not like Peter's inventing a new way of viewing the Psalms. At the same time, there were a lot of, there's a lot of debate amongst, amongst Jewish scholars of what Psalms should be considered messianic, meaning this could not be referring to what David is, his life. It has to be referring to something more. And he's pointing to this one and says, this applies. Just think of the story of David. He died, he decayed. It's not referring to him. It's referring to Jesus. And then for the sake of time, let's jump down to verse uh, 35, or excuse me, 34 and 35, where he quotes Psalm 110. He says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He says, not only did David die and decay, unlike Jesus, but David did not ascend to be the Lord of everything, where Jesus did. Jesus also quotes this psalm when he was alive. And he, he looks at where it says, the Lord said to my Lord. It says, the Lord being God said to my Lord being, so another Lord that David is referring to. And Jesus says, who's the second Lord? And it, he stumped him with that question. Because it's referring Lord as in God, Lord, also another Lord. And what he's referring to is himself as Lord. You know, the mystery of the Trinity, how God is one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what Peter is saying is like, this, this passage, again, it cannot refer to David. He's not the Lord at the same realm as Lord as in God, Yahweh. And he's not ruling over everything. He's not making the world his footstool. This can only apply to Christ. It can only apply to Jesus. And he lays it out in front of him. See here, see where David writes this? This is what he's saying. And before that, see what Joel is saying? That's what's going on right now. So if you're here and you're kind of questioning things or you're trying to figure it out, you're trying to figure out, okay, what do I believe? What do I believe about Christianity? What do I believe about Jesus? Well, start with his word. Start with his word. See what he says. There are some people that will say, it's, not, it's uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. That's what some people will say. And I get what they're saying. They're trying to distinguish of like, you're not, this is not God. But where do you learn about God? It's like, if you want to focus on the person of Jesus, where would you go to learn about him? Well, you'd go, you'd go to his word. You'd go and you learn. You want to learn about the resurrection? There's a place where you go. You want to learn about Jesus' teaching? There's a place where you go. And God made it like that. He made it like that. So if you want to truly, genuinely, authentically investigate Jesus, you start with his word. You start with his word. Now, that begs the question, why would God make it like that? Why would God just give us a word to communicate who he is? And I'm not saying the only way, but one of the primary ways. He gives his word to communicate who he is. Well, there are two, and there are a lot of answers, but here are just two quick ones. One, it's not time-bound. And two, it's not culturally bound. Not time-bound, not culturally bound. You know, if, for example, Jesus could have came when there is a video, 
and we could have video of Jesus. But he chose not to do that. Why? Has anyone here seen a picture of their parents when they were young, like in their, their teens or their 20s? Okay. Now, what do you think when you, when you see that picture? It's one you're like, wow, they're, they're a lot younger. That's one, of, that's one of the first things that stands out. And the second thing that often stands out is all the cultural stuff going on. Like, Dad, those are some sideburns, man. Like, those are some, what's going on there? And why are your pants flaring out at the bottom? You know, it's like, what's going on? There, there are some just cultural things that's time stamped that you should just see in the picture. I think my dad had a white suit or something like that. It's like some ridiculous color at his wedding. I'm like, Dad, what was what were you thinking when this happened? You know, it's like, but it's time stamped. I know. Like, in this time, I, apparently that was a normal thing to do. It's time-stamped. Or if you, if you just go and you watch eight Western movies. Now, Westerns are obviously like a certain time period in American history that's depicting. And if you watch eight of them over the last eight decades, so one from this decade, one from the last decade, and you just go through, you will notice differences. Even though they're supposed to be showing the same time period, you will notice differences where you could probably guess. And I don't just mean the film quality. I mean just the way they're dressed, the way their hair is, the way they talk. You could notice, you could probably say, oh, I bet that's from the 60s. I bet that's from the 80s. For some reason, there's techno music in a Western. <laughs> you know, whatever, that's from the 80s for sure. It's like you, you just kind of pinpoint it because the, a video is just more time-bound. It's also more culturally bound. If Jesus, if we had video of Jesus' teaching, there'd be people that would view it and be like, oh, that's not my culture, or I don't look anything like him. You know, it's, there's something glorious where if you have early paintings of Jesus when Christianity reached China 1,500 years ago, and what does he look like? Well, he looks Asian. That's because they're, they're, re they're reading what they have, and they're... they're it's like, that's not bad. That's actually, I think, a really good thing. You know, it's, and even, even when you try to give the most accurate picture of who Jesus was, it's still going to, if I'm not, the chosen is great for what it is, but in 20 years, we're going to look back at it and be like, that's so 2020. Okay? That's just the way it is. It's time bound. But the written word is less time bound and less culturally bound. Because what happens when you read, what is going on when you read is you imagining something. And you are stuck in the present. And you are stuck in your own culture. So if God wants to communicate something throughout all of history to all these different cultures and all these different times and unify them under one cause, what would be the best way to do it? The written word. It's intentional. God could use anything he possibly would want. You could have like magical birds that talk or whatever. You could pick anything. Magical chalk that writes a message whenever you ask. It's like what well, you could do with it. Anything he wants. He's God. Why does he use a word? I think that's one of the reasons why. This is going to be a very vast movement across the entire world, across times. He wants to connect to each one of them in a real way. So if you're here and you're investigating, start with the word. Start with John. That's a good place to start. Just read John. And if you're here and you want to present, you want to be like Peter, you want to present the message to other people, bring them to the word. Like, it, it's, it takes a special kind of arrogance to know the power of God's word and still think that just meeting and talking to somebody is going to have life-transforming power. It's good to talk about the weather. I'm all about talking about the weather. <laughs> you know, I'm all about talking about the latest Marvel movie that I haven't seen, okay? All about it. But at some point, the life-transforming word needs to be brought up. So um, a dream, a dream of mine is someday in Providence, you can't go to a coffee shop without seeing somebody reading the Bible there. So you just walk in, you see two people reading the Bible. Here's, some, here's an aside, some marriage advice. Is it, if, you can, if two people can be passionate about God's word and God's mission, you will never run out of things to talk about. 
Because those two things cannot be exhausted. This will never be exhausted. Everything else can be exhausted. <laughs> it's like those two things, you'll never exhaust them. You'll never run out of things to talk about. Lastly, shortly, the Christian message is life transforming. The Christian message is not one of those messages that you hear and then you immediately forget. It's not like you turn on NPR or you, or you read a newspaper or you go and you check uh, your feed, whatever feed you go to, to find out what's going on, and then you immediately go about your life unchanged. Oh, there's another war, and then you just keep on going, your life's completely not changed. It's not like that message at all. It is a life-transforming message. And for the last few minutes, I want to go through a few of the ways that it's life-transforming that Peter presents. The first one is it's life-transforming because it brings conviction. What what will this look like? It will look like conviction. This is what it says. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, like Jesus whom you crucified. Now they heard this, and they were cut to the heart. They heard the message about Jesus and about how he died for people's sins, their sins, and our sins. And they're cut to the heart, and they immediately say, what should we do? You know, one thing that would immediately change your life is if you just changed a group of friends. You know, all of us are a friend group away from eating kale, (laughs) whatever. It's like you just get a different friend group, you start eating healthier. You get a different friend group, you're going to start liking different things. That's just a part of it. But that's not the kind of transformation he's talking about. That's outward working in. This type of conviction is inward working out. They're cut to the heart. They're just pierced. And they're like, I need to know what to do. Like, this applies to me. Not because of some external pressure, not because someone's going to text me and remind me to do whatever, not because of whatever it is. What will they think if I don't? No, no, no. It's from the inside working out. What should I do, Peter? True, genuine conviction. True, genuine, like, I need a Savior. So what does that lead to? The second one, repentance. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. He's like, this is what you need to do. Repent, be baptized. Repentance means to turn, a 180 turn. Or it's also in the the Greek, it means to change your mind. So the turn isn't like a literal, and all you have to do is, you know, face north and turn south or whatever. That's not what it, it's like in the mind, you turn, change of mind. You know, like, I am going in this direction, and it is wrong against God, against others, and against me. And I am going to repent, and I'm going to turn away from that. Turn to God in a way that is good for me, and is good for others, and is glorifying to God. Reunifies with God. Genuine repentance. And true repentance is not just a out, again, it's the inward working out. It's not just a changing what you do. It's also a a turning from why you do. You can do a lot of seemingly good things for horrible reasons. Repentance is uh, turning from both. Not just the bad things we do, but the good things we do for for bad reasons. God, I turn to you. I need forgiveness from you. I need to be changed by you. And then he says repent. The third one is this, baptized. Repent and be baptized. Now, if you only had this verse... You, you might conclude that baptism is what saves you. But again, when reading the Bible, you have to read the Bible all together. And if you, if you continue to read in Acts and you continue to read in the epistles, it is not repent, and then when you get baptized, then, then you're officially saved. Paul writes, for example, in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He doesn't have in parentheses right after that, and be baptized. But they are very closely tied. Meaning as soon as you've trusted in faith, genuinely you've turned to God in repentance, you should be baptized. And if someone says, well, I don't need it to be saved, so I don't think I'm going to do it. I'm like, you're like the guy who's like married, and he always wants to take off his wedding ring when he travels on business. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you're still married, but it's fishy. 
It's such a don't. It's like there's something God has made us in such a way that there's something about publicly doing something that solidifies something, and that when you are publicly do something, if there's so hesitant hesitancy, it brings you to the point of like, okay, do I truly believe this? Do I truly understand this? Do I truly want to declare this to the world? It's meant by God to be a solidifying act. And then lastly, it's not only um, conviction and repentance and baptism, it's also new life. There will be a change. This is what he says later on. He says, and when they heard these, uh, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. The gospel that's presented to them is not just fire insurance for future judgment. It's not just, you know, how to live with God in eternity. It is going to have ramifications in the here and now. He says, turn from this wicked generation. I was out um, about a month ago. We We did this thing where we were handing out clothes to a lot of the homeless down at the Kennedy Plaza. And around this time... Uh, all the high schools downtown. There are a handful of high schools downtown. They get out. So the bus stop is just buzzing with hundreds, hundreds of teenagers. And it's God graced me with, sometimes just God graces you with seeing things the way he sees things. And I was seeing all these teenagers and seeing them not as, not as just people, but souls. And notice in the later in the passage, it says in about 3,000 souls were added to their numbers. Like, these people are souls. And I was thinking, if they become Christians now, not only would they be saved into eternity, knowing God, into eternity, but they're 18, they're 17, they're 16. Just think of all the decisions that they could avoid over the next five years of their life that they would regret over the next 40 like, God doesn't just, he wants to save us for eternity. And, you know, he gets so much happiness and joy when someone's on their deathbed and turns to him. Like, he gets so much joy from that. But it's, it's also a tremendous thing. When someone's 18, they turn to God, and they avoid years and years and years of a temporal heartache towards themselves and then things they would do towards others, too. God wants to give us new life. So that when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name on earth as it is in heaven, that that prayer could actually be visualized. You're like, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm seeing you change my life on earth as it will someday be in heaven. Let's pray.